Some motorcycles and ATVs are simply difficult to start. One of them is this 1983 Honda Silverwing. This is a fully charged lead acid battery. And this is what it sounds like to crank it over. So to fix the problem, I made my own battery out of lithium iron phosphate cells. Now to crank the bike, it sounds like this. This lithium phosphate battery is better in every way. Not only is it lighter and more powerful, but it will last three times as long as a lead acid battery. It has a nice little built-in voltmeter, and you can build it for half the cost of an equivalent lead acid battery. I'm Alex Grieve, and welcome to Higher Voltage. This battery uses four sets of six 18650 lithium iron phosphate cells, so a total of 24 cells will be needed. To make a set of six in series, I'm simply straightening them out on a straight edge, in this case just using a ruler, but a wall works just fine, and then using hot glue to keep them in place. The hot glue isn't so much of a permanent fix as just something to hold them in place long enough for me to solder a nickel strip to the ends. Note here that all of six cells are facing the same direction, and thus the same polarity. To electrically connect the cells, I'm going to use a nickel strip. You can find these all over the place from lithium wholesalers as well as eBay, and they're all pretty much the same. Just measure them out so they go across all six cells, and they can be cut by something as simple as scissors or a pair of diagonals if you prefer. To bond the nickel strip to the batteries, I'm using soldering paste. Typically these are welded, but most people don't have a spot welder for these batteries, and I find that soldering them works really well. I should note that a powerful soldering iron is going to be needed here. A weak soldering iron can overheat the cells with excessive time. Soldering paste is a convenient way to get both solder and flux in between your batteries and the strip. Make sure to wipe off any excess so it doesn't work its way down the cell and possibly short it out. Then drop your nickel strip over the battery and then solder it in place. To make the heating go faster and thus not overheat the cell, I'm using solder over top of it, not to add solder, but to increase the effective surface area of my soldering iron and thus make the bond happen quicker. Again, you need to heat this up enough to liquefy the solder and get it to bond. However, if it takes too long, you can overheat the cell and damage it. You'll note that I'm using a pair of pliers to push on each joint before moving the soldering iron. This is to make sure I retain a good connection while the solder cools. Once a nickel strip is connected to one side, simply flip the batteries over and repeat the process on the other side. Thus, all the positive leads are connected together and all the negative leads are connected together for each set of six. Again, you're going to need four sets of six batteries like this. Again, I'm using solder paste. This is no clean. That is, it's supposed to have a very small amount of flux and thus the minimal amount of cleaning I'll have to do. Although, I will still need to do quite a bit of cleaning. You'll notice here that there's a bit of nickel strip hanging off the end. The reason for this is this is going to be my negative lead, so I need a little bit of nickel strip hanging off the end to connect my wire to. The end strips, that is the strips that will be connected to the positive and negative leads of the battery, are the ones that are going to take the most current. And just to be sure I have enough current carrying capability, I'm going to add an additional nickel strip right over top of both the positive and the negative leads. Again, I'm going to use solder paste between the two of them to be sure I have a good bond between them. This second nickel strip not only lowers the internal resistance and thus gives me more cold cranking amps for the bike, but it also gives me a little bit of insurance that the end of these tabs isn't going to burn away in the case the bike doesn't start easily and I need to stay on the starter a little bit longer than normal. Again, I'm using solder paste between the joint and then placing a soldering iron with a little bit of extra solder to increase the surface area of the iron over top and bonding it together. While I don't really need to bond it to every cell all the way down, I feel this is simply a more professional way to do it. The next step is to bond my four sets of six cells together into one solid unit. In order to do this, I'm going to start by hot gluing them together to make a brick. 
you'll notice that I alternate top to bottom between the batteries. That is, the positive on one side faces up, then the next set, the negative faces up, then positive, then negative, and alternate. Alternating the packs, one up, one down, allows me to connect the packs in series to make a 12.8 volt battery. Now I'll need to electrically connect these batteries in series. Again, I'm using solder paste and nickel strips. You'll note the nickel strips are cut just barely long enough to cover two batteries. I'm going to use two of these on each end of the cell pack to be sure I can deliver enough current to crank over my motorcycle. You'll note here that I'm not bridging the middle set of cells, but the outer two sets of cells. The middle set will be bridged on the other side. Once one side of the battery has the cells adequately bridged, flip it over and then connect the center strips. Be very careful here. You do not want to accidentally touch the cells on either side of these as this will create a massive short and can damage your strips, tools, or even the battery. Again, I'm using two strips on either end of the battery to be sure I have enough current carrying capability to crank a motorcycle. The technique here is the same as all of the other nickel strips. Heat up the area as fast as possible then hold it in place with a metal tool and remove the soldering iron after everything is liquefied and bonded. While not explicitly required, it's always a good idea to use a BMS, or a battery management system. In the drone world, we call this a battery balancer. The job of the battery balancer is to discharge overcharge cells so that the entire battery retains a constant voltage. To connect my BMS, I'm simply using 22 gauge wire connected to each set of batteries on each side. The negative lead, that is my black lead, is going to go to B- on my battery balancer. You'll see that I'm adding tape here, and then I'm labeling them with each place the wires will go. The red wire, that is my positive lead, goes to B+, or in this case, on this BMS system, it's called B4. The black is B minus, or B zero. The other side of the pack only gets two wires. These go to B one and B three. When doing this, use caution to be sure your wires don't touch someplace that they're not supposed to and cause the short, because at this point, this battery is live and capable of a very, very high current. Before moving on, I want to clean up all the flux residue off of the battery leads. Flux is corrosive and can lead to premature failure of the battery. To do this, I'm simply using spray-on flux cleaner and a toothbrush, and then I'll simply dab it off with a paper towel when it's done. This battery is going to get one more thing, a voltmeter. And to connect this, I have to connect one more wire to the positive lead and another wire to the negative lead. To avoid a parasitic drain on the battery, I'm going to connect this voltmeter through a button so it only illuminates when I press the button. Last but certainly not least, I'm connecting my power wires. For this, I'm using two 12 gauge wires in parallel on each of the leads, both the positive and the negative. This will carry more than enough current to crank over just about every motorcycle. For caution's sake, I'm putting a little bit of hot glue around the positive and negative leads of the battery. This is mostly to prevent shorting should something get inside the battery and be able to touch the terminals, but also to keep the terminals in place so they don't fatigue over time. To house my new battery, I made this laser cut enclosure. The CAD files are available in the video description below. Simply take the CAD files to any laser cutter or water jet and ask them to cut it out. I'm using acrylic here to showcase the battery, but in all honesty, ABS is probably a better material. The enclosure I designed has a cutout for a button, and this is to activate the voltmeter that I talked about earlier. The positive lead from the battery goes to one end of the button, and then the positive lead of the voltmeter goes to the other lead of the button, so that when the button is pressed, power is transferred from the positive lead into the voltmeter, thus displaying the battery's voltage. I found this voltmeter on eBay for $3. Now I can go ahead and wire up my BMS system. To hold it in place, I simply electrical taped it to the battery case itself so it wouldn't move when I'm soldering. Be very careful when soldering this together. Remember that each of these leads is hot, and if you short out a lead, thus touch two pads together, you're going to create a short which can dam damage your soldering iron, the BMS, or the wires. The negative lead of the battery goes to B- or B0, depending on which BMS system you have. Then, each set of batteries in sequence goes 1 through 4, all the way up to the positive lead going to B4 or B+. Again, be very careful here not to short out the board when soldering, as this will cause a short that could damage your system. 
While at the beginning I was attempting to put the wire through the hole and then solder it in place, I found it much easier to pre-tin the pad, then heat it up and drop the wire through the hole while the solder was liquefied. A little bit of hot glue over the leads of the BMS provides both strain relief and electrical insulation. Before installing my ring terminals, I'm going to glue the top on the battery to have a better idea of where these ring terminals will actually sit. I don't want the power leads of the battery to be too long, so I'm going to cut them approximately one inch longer than where they come out of the battery. Then I strip off about a half of an inch and install my ring terminal. Rather than crimping it in place, it's a much better connection to solder it in place. Most ring terminals are tin plated and thus they accept solder relatively easily. Just heat it up as much as you need. Unlike the batteries inside, you can heat up a ring terminal more than hot enough. Then, just to be sure I don't get a short, I add a little bit of heat shrink tubing. Before sealing up my battery, I'll need to put my voltmeter somewhere I can see it. And because this is clear acrylic, I can simply glue it up against the window. The lower plate of the battery is installed with a tab facing the inside of the battery. The face plate with the button that activates the voltmeter is going to be placed between these two plates. You can see that it has a tab and a cutout to mate with the tab and cutout that are already on the battery. And that's it a high power, high performance power sports battery for less than the cost of a lead acid battery. I'm Alex Grieve, and this has been another episode of Higher Voltage.